Hello everyone, welcome to the 225 Literary and Jury Charge. I'm going to read the jury charge at 200 and the literary will be at 180. Okay, we're going to start off with some civil jury charge. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, at the conclusion of a case such as this, it is customary for the judge to instruct the jury on the law pertaining to the case. It is the exclusive province of the jury to determine all questions as to the facts involved, and it is equally the exclusive province of the court to determine all matters of law. In every case, there are certain standard instructions given to jurors outlining to them the general principles of law which apply in all civil cases. There are also certain special instructions which the court gives to the jury which applies particularly to the case on trial. I will first proceed to give you those special instructions which apply particularly to this case due to the circumstances involved. Both of the plaintiffs have alleged that they were engaged at the time of the accident in removing forms in the course of their employment from a certain concrete manhole adjacent to the gas mains maintained and controlled by the defendant gas company in the case. They have alleged that an explosion took place because of the carelessness and negligence of the defendant company and that as a result, direct or approximate result of the explosion, the injuries received by them followed. The injuries and damages which are claimed by the respective plaintiffs are these. The plaintiff, Roberts, claims that as approximate result of the accident and explosion in this case, he received first degree and second degree and third degree burns on his face, both forearms and both hands. It is for these injuries that plaintiff Roberts claims monetary damages from the defendant. Okay, I have some bird facts. And there are several different facts that you're going to hear, and I think it's good practice because it jumps from one fact to another. So it really doesn't have a, a flow to it, which I think is important to be able to just write what you hear. Okay, here we go. Here we go, ready? The battler eagle of Africa hunts over a territory of 250 square miles a day. A bird sees everything at once in total focus, whereas the human eye is globular and must adjust to varying distances. The bird's eye is flat and can take in everything at once in a single glance. Utility workers in the desert of Southern California have developed a unique system for finding gas leaks. The desert areas of Southern California are heavily populated by a bird known as the turkey buzzard, which has an exceptionally keen sense of smell. The utility companies add a substance to the natural gas, which is odorless in its pure state, that gives it a smell that arouses the turkey buzzard's mating instincts. Whenever there is a break in a line, vast numbers of excited birds are drawn to the spot. By looking for clusters of these anxious birds, linemen are able to determine the precise location of the leak. Parent, excuse me, parrots, most famous of all talking birds, rarely acquire a vocabulary of more than 20 words. The bird with the largest population in the world is the red-billed quilla, an inhabitant of Africa. Two farmers, red-billed quillas, are known as feathered locusts. For they travel in flocks that number in the millions and leave devastation behind them wherever and whenever they land on crops. At last count, there were approximately 10 billion of these birds in existence. The only bird with nearly so great a population was the passenger pigeon, which in 1840 had a population of about 9 billion. As a result of excessive hunting by man, the passenger pigeon was extinct less than 80 years later. A robin has almost 3,000 feathers. The female condor lays a single egg once every two years. An ostrich may weigh as much as 300 pounds. Its intestinal tract is 45 feet long. A bird chews with its stomach. Since most birds do not have teeth, a bird routinely swallows small pebbles and gravel. These grits become vigorously agitated in the bird's stomach and serve to grind food as it passes through the digestive system. The ruby-throated hummingbird moves its wings at a rate of 200 wing beats per second. Hens do not have to be impregnated to lay eggs. The rooster is necessary only to fertilize the egg. It may take more than two days for a chick to break out of its shell. There is approximately one chicken for every human being in the world. 
90% of all species that have become extinct have been birds. More turkeys are raised in California than in any other state in the United States. In 1956, a white leghorn chicken belonging to a farmer in Vinland, New Jersey, laid an egg that weighed more than one, or excuse me, more than a pound. This is the largest chicken egg recorded to date. There are no penguins at the North Pole. In fact, there are no penguins anywhere in the Northern Hemisphere. All 17 varieties of the bird are found below the equator, primarily in Antarctica. Pretty interesting facts. All right. I'm going to read a little bit on siller, or I'm sorry, serial killers. And some of it is a little disturbing, but again, we have to get used to it so that if we work in court, we're going to we're going to come across this, okay? Okay. Ready? And this is called thrill killers. These types of offenders specifically derive sadistic pleasure from the process of killing, not the actual killing, but the acts leading up to it. To enjoy the act, they need to keep their victims immobilized and alive and aware of what is happening to them. They often kill in elaborate, ritualized methods and sometimes take a respite, a respite and revive victims who lose consciousness before continuing their torture. A surviving victim of Richard Cunningham testified that he wiped her face down with a cool, damp cloth between bouts of torture. These sadistically driven killers derive pleasure from the pain and suffering their victims go through as they die. Once the victim is dead, they almost immediately lose interest. Post-mortem mutilation and necrophiliac acts are not a frequent char characteristic of this kind of murder. Thrill murders often involve three distinct crime scenes where the victim is captured, is highly controlled in a highly controlled environment where the victim is killed, and finally a site where the victim is quickly dumped. Thrill killers are often attractive, intelligent, charismatic, psychopathic personalities relying on their charm to seduce and lure victims to their deaths. They may pose as police officers and arrest their victims. They are highly controlled and controlling, carefully selecting and stalking their desired victim type. They either maintain a carefully chosen location where they torture and murder their victims or customize a vehicle, frequently a van, for their killing. The body is often disposed of so as to deliberately lead investigators away from the killing scene. And again, this is from a, you know, an actual book on... Uh, the psychology of all of this and you know if chances are if you work in court you're going to hear this in court okay all right moving right into some jury charge and the subject is exemplary damages ready To justify an award of exemplary damages, the wrongful act must have been done willfully, wantingly, or maliciously. The mere fact that an act is wrongful or unlawful does not justify such damages. The fact that an act was done maliciously may be inferred from the fact that it was done with insult, cruelty, opp oppression, or other aggravated circumstances. It has been said that the word malice in this connection implies that the act complained of was done in a spirit of mischief or of criminal indifference to civil obligations, that it must have been done or in wanton indifference to the rights invaded. Whatever is done willfully and purposely, if it be at the same time wrong and unlawful, is in legal contemplation malicious. However, inasmuch as it is well settled that exemplary damages may be recovered for a willful or wanted injury, irrespective of actual malice, it seems desirable to use the term malice in this connection in its ordinary popular sense. It is argued that the court violated this rule when it instructed the jurors that if, under the testimony of the case, they found that such 
assault and committed willfully and wa wantingly and wrongfully, they could allow plaintiffs such additional sums as they thought would be proper and right by the way of punitive or exemplary damages for the purpose of deterring others from the commission of similar acts in the future. The recovery of punitive damages is, by the instruction, left to the discretion of the jurors. They were not informed that they must return such damages if the evidence showed that the assault was willfully and unlawfully committed. It is contended that the instruction is erroneous because the trial court failed to use the word malicious. We think this contention, if sustained, would unduly restrict the cases in which exemplary damages are recoverable. The authorities very generally permit recovery when the tort is committed with cruelty, oppression, insult, or such gross negligence as to justify the inference of malicious, or excuse me, of malice as a matter of law. The conditions under which such damages are recoverable are stated in the alternative. All these conditions need not concur. Whatever is done willfully and purposely, if it be at the same time wrong and unlawful, and that known to the party is, in legal contemplation malicious, that which is done contrary to one's own conviction of duty, or with a willful discard of the rights of others, whether it be to compass some unlawful end, or some lawful end by unlawful means, knowing it to be such constitutes legal malice. Okay, hey, I have some land description. This is only about a paragraph long. Okay, there we go. Part of farm lot number 45, more particularly described as follows, commencing at a point in the south limit of Elliott Street as laid down on registered plan 643, town of Ridgeway, distant 4,491 feet, northwesterly from the intersection of the southwest limit of Elliott Road and the northwest limit of Main Street in the town of Ridgeway thence northwesterly in the southwest limit of Elliott Road, 66 feet, thence southwesterly and at the right angles to the southwest limit of Elliott Road, 40 feet, thence southeasterly and parallel to the southwest limit of Elliott Road, 66 feet, thence northeasterly and at right angles to the southwest limit of Elliott Road, 45 feet to the place of the beginning. <clears throat> All right, I've got some legal. Uh, these are legal terms, but they're in a paragraph form. Here we go. Ready? A client employs an attorney to represent him in a legal proceeding or for legal advisement. The client who starts the legal proceeding is known as the plaintiff. The party charged in an action is known as the defendant. The plaintiff and the defendant are entitled to due process. A party to a lawsuit may be referred to as the litigant. The word versus means against. Versus is normally abbreviated in running text to lowercase v period. On the majority of transcript, cover sheets, and title pages, the letters v, s, period are used. In a legal proceeding, the plaintiff's name is first, followed by the defendant's name, for example, Smith v. Jones. Smith is the plaintiff and Jones is the defendant. In a criminal case, the plaintiff is referred to as the people of the state of, followed by the name of the state in which the proceeding is tried. The legal proceeding may be referred to as the suit or as the litigation. A writ is a written command issued by a court requiring some action. All right. I've got some challenging material on profit. Here we go, ready? The goal of every small privately owned business should be profit. This is normally the purpose upon which the business is founded. Profit is the reward that any entrepreneur receives for taking calculated risk and winning and for responding and providing services that are needed in the community. Profit-making is not a short-range goal, but rather a long-term challenge that provides a definite and precise indication of a business's success over a month, a year, a decade, or even a century. 
Profit is fundamental to a business's life. Without profit, working capital is depleted, which eventually results in economic losses to not only the employers, suppliers, and consumers, but to the economy as well. When the profit-seeking goal is con is complemented by other non-financial objectives that are consumer-oriented, the serious entrepreneur will find that he is on the road to success in the business world. He may find that he can help others attain this goal. All right. I'm going to read. This is a... Uh, the, this book is called Life with William Randolph Hearst, The Times We Had. This is from his mistress. Uh, if you, you know, haven't heard, William Randolph Hearst is the, well, was the owner of the Hearst Castle up in Central California. So we recently went, my husband and I went there, and uh, I thought this book would be interesting. This is his... Uh, his mistress of I think 30 years so I'm going to start with um, let's see here and we're gonna start with the foreword here okay here we go ready comparisons are not invariably odious but they are often misleading in their enthusiasm for the truly fascinating book Early readers called Marion Davis and William Randolph Hearst the Jackie and Ari of their day. And why? Because they had more glamour, power, and money than anyone else. The truth is that Hearst was never rich in the way that Onassis was rich, and the power of Onassis resided solely in his money. He could buy himself an airline, an island, or a Greek colonel, but his place in history is recorded largely in the gossip columns. Hearst published the gossip columns. He practically invented them. The difference is immense. If Hearst was not a great man, he was certainly a towering figure in the first half of this century. If he now be, excuse me, if he had been ten times richer than he was, he would not now be primarily remembered for his millions. Onassis was neither a great man nor a great force in the world. He was quite simply and purely a celebrity. You make the money, Hearst might well have said to him, I'll make these celebrities. This, of course, is a paraphrase. When Frederick Remington was dispatched to the Cuban front to provide the Hearst newspapers with sketches of our first small step into American imperialism, the noted artist complained by telegram that there wasn't really enough shooting to keep him busy. You make the pictures, Hearst wired back, and I'll make the war. This can be recognized not only as the true voice of power, but also as a line of dialogue from a movie. In fact, it is the only purely Hertzian element in Citizen Kane. There are parallels, but these can just be misleading as comparisons. If San Simeon hadn't existed, it would have been necessary for the authors of the movie to invent it. Except for the telegram already noted and the crazy art collection, much too good to resist, in Cain, everything was invented. Let the incredulous take note of the facts. William Randolph Hearst was born rich. He was the pampered son of an adoring mother. That is the decisive fact about him. Charles Foster Cain was born poor and was raised by a bank. There is no room here for details, but the differences between the real man and the character in the film are far greater than those between the ship owner and the newspaper tycoon. And what of Susan Alexander? What indeed? It was a real man who built an opera house for the soprano of his choice, and much in the movie was borrowed from that story, but the man was not Hearst. Susan Kane's second wife is not even based on the real-life soprano, soprano. Like most fictional characters, Susan's resemblance to the other fictional characters is quite startling. To Marion Davis, she bears no resemblance at all. Kane picked up Susan on the street corner from nowhere where the poor girl herself thought she was belonged. Marion Davis was no dim shop girl. She was a famous beauty who had her choice of rich, powerful, and attractive beaux before Hearst set, sent his first boutique and, or excuse me, bouquet to her stage door. That Susan was Kane's wife and Marion was Hearst's mistress 
is a difference more important than might be guessed in today's changed climate of opinion. The wife was a puppet and a prisoner. The mistress was never less than a princess. Hearst built more than one castle, and Marion was the hostess in all of them. They were, they were pleasure domes indeed, and the beautiful people of the day fought for invitations. Xanadu was a lonely fortress, and Susan was quite right to escape from it. The mistress was never one of Hearst's possessions. He was always her suitor, and she was the precious treasure of his heart for more than thirty years, until his last breath of life. Theirs is truly a love story. Love is not the subject of Citizen Kane. Susan was forced into a singing career because Kane had been forced out of the politics. She was pushed from one public disaster to another by the bitter frustration of the man who believed that because he had married her and raised her up out of obscurity, she was his to use as he might will. There is hatred in that. Hearst put up the money for many of the movies in which Marion Davis was starred in, more importantly backed her with publicity, but this was less a favor than might appear. That vast publicity machine was all too visible. And finally, instead of helping, it cast a shadow, a shadow of doubt. Could the star have existed without the machine? The question darkened an otherwise brilliant career. As one who shares much of the blame for casting another shadow, the shadow of Susan Alexander Kane, I rejoice in this opportunity to record something which today is all but forgotten, except for those lucky enough to have seen a few of her pictures. Marion Davis was one of the most delightfully accomplished comedians in the whole history of the screen. She would have been a star if Hearst had never happened. She was also a delightful person and a very considerable person. The proof is in the book and I commend it to you. And that was from Orson Welles. He's the one that um, wrote the movie Citizen Kane and a lot of people thought that he was comparing uh, the, uh, the movie to the actual real life uh, you know, William Randolph Hearst and Marion Davis. So he's, that's his forward saying, no, it had nothing to do with these two people. And that was the, uh, the reasons why. So uh, we'll start in the next class. We'll start in uh, chapter one, and it's all about uh, Marion Davis and her life. Okay, so that concludes our literary and jury charge for the 225 class.